Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Megan. I am a K-12 educator with um, Capital Health. And uh, before we get started, I want to just um, make sure we have a few housekeeping items. Um, just as a reminder, should any technical difficulties occur, we appreciate your patience and understanding as we work to quickly address them. Mute your microphones, please, um, to help keep background noise to a minimum and make sure you're, you mute your microphone when you are not speaking. Additionally, remember that the private chat is never fully private, so just be aware of what you write in the chat box. Please fill out the evaluation surveys at the end of the lecture. Um, I have that link dropped right into the chat box, so you can find it there after the lecture. Um, and please hold any questions you have until the end. Um, you can either drop your questions in the chat box and we'll um, address them at the end, or towards the end we'll have a brief Q&A session. All right, so without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker for tonight, Dr. Joshua Hornstein. Uh, he is a board certified sports medicine orthopedic surgeon specializing in injuries of the shoulder, knee, and hip. His clinical interests are rotator cuff injuries, shoulder dislocations and instability, anterior cruciate ligament injuries, and the treatment of hip impingement syndrome, labrum tears, and gluteal tendon tears. Currently, Dr. Hornstein serves as the orthopedic team physician for the College of New Jersey and provides orthopedic care for Lawrence, Northern Burlington Regional and Nottingham High Schools. He has been clinical instructor for shoulder arthroscopy at the Orthopedic Learning Center in Chicago and has given numerous local and national lectures on both hip preservation surgery and rotator cuff repair. Dr. Hornstein is licensed in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. He's a member of several professional societies, including the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, the American Orthopedic Society for Sports Medicine, and the Arthroscopy Association of North America. Dr. Hornstein is also a member of the Board of Trustees for Greenwood House, an assisted living and nursing facility in Ewing, New Jersey. He has dedicated his career to treating all types of athletes of all ages, from recreational to collegiate and professional. So without further ado, please, um, well, let's welcome Dr. Hornstein. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Megan. Okay, um, so let's just make sure everybody has our microphones on mute and we will get started. Okay. So I'm gonna talk tonight about the uh, shoulder, uh, it's something that's been a passion of mine for my entire career. Um, and we're gonna talk about some of the diagnoses, some of the anatomy, and also some of the treatment things that are in both current and in the future that are coming around the corner. Okay. So we're gonna, again, talk about basic anatomy. We're going to talk about the pathology. Why am I not hearing him? 12 and 13, be protected from the- Can you hear me, Megan? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me keep going. Um, we're gonna talk about basic anatomy, some of the uh, etiologies of uh, shoulder pain, such as uh, pathology in the sh uh, that occurs in the shoulder, what kind of diagnoses we see, how we treat problems, and also the emerging technologies that are coming around the corner. Okay. So let's talk about the anatomy of the shoulder. Its job is to con con connect the axial skeleton, which is the body, to the appendicular skeleton, which is the arms and the legs. So it al shoulder allows for a lar large range of motion, and its job is to position the hand in space. And anytime there's a lot of supporting structures from the skin all the way down to the shoulder joint, there's a high risk for injury. And when there's a lot, lot of large amount of motion in a particular joint, there's also a risk for a lot of, for a risk for injury. The articulation of the shoulder is called the glenohumeral joint. So the glenoid is the socket and the humerus is the ball. It's really more of a golf ball on a golf tee configuration. Then we have different bony landmarks. We have the coracoid, which is um, the bump in the front of your shoulder, which you can feel and push on. The acroion, which is the roof bone of the shoulder, the greater tuberosity, and the, let and the AC joint, which are two prony prominences as well on the shoulder. And then we have ligaments, which I'll show you next in the next picture, that uh, control motion of the shoulder. And then we have a uh, joint fluid, which gives some adhesion and cohesion in the shoulder joint. The rotator cuff. 
Those are the motor muscles that move the shoulder. There's four muscles. Um, this is a very common area to be injured, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And they also help stabilize the joint with relaxation and contraction. And also deconditioning of those muscles can really cause a problem with stability of the shoulder as well as function of the shoulder. These are the ligaments, the joint capsule. Well, the ligaments are thickenings of the joint capsule. They control movement of the shoulder based on position of the arm. Usually the um, shoulder the functional position is the 90-90 or throwing position like so. Um, and those, that's when those ligaments contract, they're I'm sorry, contract, that's when they tighten up. So the IGHLC, which stands for the inferior glenohumeral ligament complex is the primary static stabilizer of the shoulder in the functional throwing 90-90 position. And like any other ligament, they act as a check rein um, at the extremes of motion. They also go between two bones. That's what ligaments do. Okay, the labrum. So in the, when we move the ball away, we have a labrum, which is a bumper cushion around the socket. It's actually white in real life. This is red on this picture. And it deepens the articulation of the socket by about 40%. So if you think of a golf ball and a golf tee, if you took a bead of caulk and ran it around that golf tee, that's what the labrum does. Um, the long head of the biceps is right here. That attaches to the top of the socket at the 12 o'clock position. And its function really is known at this point, but it does actually keep the head somewhat centered, but it really doesn't do much except cause trouble, which again, I will discuss later in the talk. So let's talk about arthroscopy. Arthroscopy is a technique where we use a camera, fiber optic camera and we pass instruments through small little small incisions around the body, any, any joint for that matter, but in this case, the shoulder. And the idea is we want to decrease the risk of surgical incisions. So we're kind of doing the surgery from the inside out versus the outside in. Arthroscopy is done through small little holes called portals. And they're usually three to four millimeter little incisions that we use to put the camera in, as well as we can pass instruments and introduce implants and repair things. So some of the, some of the pictures you'll see will be arthroscopy pictures such as this one right here. This is a shoulder right here. Here's the ball right here, and the socket is down below. So what can we do with arthroscopy? We can take care of problems that are inside the shoulder joint, such as labrum tears, loose bodies of bone and cartilage, and shoulder instability or dislocations. Then we can also go above the rotator cuff in the space between the acromion, the roof bone, and the rotator cuff. We can address rotator cuff tears. We can address bone spurs and arthritis. And then in both locations, we can adjust what's called a frozen shoulder. These are all things we're going to talk about shortly. Arthroscopy, what we want to do is we want to look through the entire shoulder joint. We want to look at the entire labrum all the way around. We want to look at the biceps tendon attachment site and where the labrum attaches. We want to look at the undersurface, the rotator cuff, and then we're going to pop up into the space above the rotator cuff called the subacromial space or subacromial bursa. All right, so let's talk about pathology and treatment. So what, what do we find in the shoulder? Common things we find and what kind of treatments do we have? First, we need to talk about a very common tech, uh, imaging technique called the MRI or magnetic resonance imaging or MRI. It's a very much a very ever developing technology as our computers get faster and the magnets get stronger, we can have better images. So basically what an MRI does, it uses a magnet to excite hydrogen atoms in your body's tissues and change the way their, their directions to which they're pointing those hydrogen atoms and then we can get images, and that's what this looks like here. So we take different slices in the coronal or frontal view. We take the axial or view from above the, above the ceiling, looking straight down on a shoulder joint. So we can also take sagittal or side views of the, of the shoulder, of any joint for that matter. And again, as I always tell all my patients, we must correlate the MRI with the history of the physical examination, not just take the MRI on its own. And we have to treat the patient, not the MRI. All right, so let's talk about shoulder instability. We can have traumatic shoulder instability, which occurs from an injury, atraumatic instability, which occurs without an injury. We can have it in one direction or multi-directional. So when I see somebody with shoulder instability, I wanna um, ask them how many times, uh, I wanna ask if they've had a previous injury, this is their first one. I wanna know if they've had a dislocation of their shoulder where it pops out and somebody has to manually put it back in, how many times that has happened. So a couple words of uh, definition here, a dislocation, is where, the, where a joint pops out and, some, and has to be physically put back in. A subluxation is where the joint goes out and it, can be, it goes back in on its own. So it's a little differentiation. I wanna know what sport do they play? Do they play chess? Do they play rugby or football? And I wonder if they have any other medical conditions that might affect their shoulder. I wanna look at their examination. Do some, is somebody able to do putting their thumb to the forearm? Uh, I can't do that, but a lot of people can. 
that come into my practice. So that's something to know that they have a lot of ligamentous laxity or looseness of their joints. I want to check their range of motion. I want to look at their shoulder. I want to check their strength. I want to uh, do what's called an apprehension test, which is this test down below here where we take the arm over the head or behind the head and we push it back. And if the shoulder's unstable, because the ligaments aren't working normally, we want to, uh, well, the shoulder will feel like it's coming out of place for that person. And then when we push it back, the, um, the shoulder feels it's reduced and doesn't hurt. So how do we talk about injuries in the shoulder? So injury, injury patterns. We talk about the socket or the glenoid as a clock face. So on a right shoulder from two o'clock to six o'clock is called a Bankart lesion named after the doctor who discovered it about 80 years ago. Uh, the server that injury occurs with a uh, dislocation. Uh, then we have a slap tear, which goes from 11 to one, uh, one o'clock. So that stands for, that's a superior labrum, S, L, anterior to posterior, AP. So it goes from superior upper labrum, from anterior to posterior, front to back. Then we have at seven to 11 o'clock is a reverse bank heart lesion, which is basically the opposite when you have a posterior dislocation or dislocation goes out the back of the shoulder. Then we talk about, about it as a soft tissue injury. If it's just the soft tissues, the ligaments, and the labrum, or is there a bony component? Is there a fracture associated with this, which we'll see shortly. So what do we want to do? We always want to do x-rays to look for a fracture. Uh, we also want to look to see what the bony anatomy looks like. Then an MRI with or without contrast eye. And we have to remember here that a labrum tear, since the ligaments, the inferior glenohumeral ligament complex is attached to the labrum. If we have a labrum tear, that's essentially like having a ligament tear. And then we have slap tears. They're very common. That's a slap tear right up here, this little white area here in this top part of the triangle where the, where the biceps attaches. These are very common in anybody over the age of 45. And they're usually not the cause of patient's problem. But sometimes in younger patients, they can be the source of their pain. So not every dislocation needs surgery. I've dislocated my shoulder three times and never had surgery on it. Um, not a great example for my patients, but that's uh, you know back in 1983 when I saw my doctor, that's what he recommended for me. So um, there's conservative treatments such as a brief sling immobilization, home or physical therapy, and that sometimes works. And sometimes people won't have another dislocation for the rest of their life. And then there's also surgical treatment, which is an open or arthroscopic repair. I would say that in my practice, this is probably 99% of the time, and this is probably 1% of the time. So when I first started practicing in, in, people, in the wor real world, this is probably 50-50. So we've really come a long way with our minimally invasive techniques over the last 20 years. So um, let's talk about surgical treatment. Uh, indications, it's really based on the history and physical examination. Do I have somebody who is a contact or collision athlete or a football player? Do I have somebody in the military who has to have their shoulder functioning normally to be an active duty member of the military? So really, and do we want to treat somebody who's got a first time dislocation with surgery? If I said that 20 years ago, that would have been looked at uh, like I was a crazy person. But nowadays, this is, this is actually standard and, and routine care to treat somebody who's had a first time dislocation to offer them the option of surgery. So I've looked at this kind of as open repairs, the gold standard and arthroscopic surgery is the new gold standard. So that's where we've come uh, over the last 20 to 25 years. Okay, so we talked about this open versus arthroscopic surgery. They really are equivalent procedures. Um, the socket, because it's very small, if you lose it, if bone loss occurs on the socket because of multiple dislocations, think about whittling a piece of bone away every time you hit it with that knife, it's gonna whittle down a little piece of bone and that's exactly what happens every time the ball hits the socket. That's the biggest predictor of an arthroscopic failure. So in my practice, the biggest reason to do an open surgery is if somebody has a large amount of bone loss on their socket. And again, we just talked about this a little bit about the first time dislocator about waiting versus waiting and seeing. Uh, it's really to me based on their activity and occupation. If I have a football player, I'm gonna strongly recommend they get their shoulder fixed because their risk of re-dislocation is extremely high over 90%. If I have somebody like myself who's 51, first time dislocation, I'm probably gonna suggest that they not get surgery and will likely be okay for the rest of their life, probably less than 20% risk of dislocation again. Okay, so what do we do after surgery? Uh, we basically immobilize people with a sling uh, for about a month. We give them some very mild pain medication for a short period of time. We usually start physical therapy. Uh, earlier for my senior patients, which is over the age of 25, we try to start them within about a week to two weeks. Whereas my, my, my teenage and college students, we'll start them about two weeks post-op. Okay, let's talk, let's shift gears to osteoarthritis. 
Uh, it's a relatively uncommon entity compared to knee, hip, and back arthritis um, and hand arthritis, but it is common in my practice. So arthritis basically means that the, the, the cartilage cap, the cartilage on the ball in the socket has worn away, just like a bare, uh, tire, tread wear away on a tire. And over time, the, you basically end up with bone exposed and bone exposed. So you basically see there's no space here between the socket and the ball. And that is essentially the um, cartilage is worn down. It can be also from rotator cuff tears or from multiple dislocations. So not everybody with arthritis gets a shoulder replacement, but some people do. Uh, usually we can start, start out with treatment with an anti-inflammatory medicine, cortisone shots. We will sometimes do visco supplementation, which we talked about in our knee lecture uh, a few months ago, but that is actually what's called an off-label procedure, meaning it's not approved by insurance, but we can certainly try that if somebody wishes to pay for it. We could try physical therapy or decreasing activity level. And then from a surgical standpoint, we can clean up the shoulder arthroscopically. We can go in there for a younger patient. What I would consider under 55 would be a younger patient with arthritis of the shoulder. And we can try to get some more motion. And then you have shoulder replacement and reverse shoulder replacement. And that's a specific type of procedure for just people with, our, with rotator cuff tears. So an, a shoulder replacement is total shoulder replacement means that the ball is replaced with metal and the socket is replaced with plastic. And it's done through an open approach. And you're basically, like I say, going to replace the ball with metal and the socket with plastic. They have about a 12 to 15 year life expectancy. And we want to get people moving quickly, uh, early strengthening, early motion, usually takes about six months to recover. It's very good for pain relief. It's pretty good for function. The function will be slightly improved post-operatively as it was preoperatively, but not that much improved. It's unlike a hip or a knee, which really is a substantial difference in function. The shoulder replacement has pretty good improvement in function. All right, so let's talk about fractures. So we talk about the proximal humerus of the upper end of the shoulder where the ball is, not the socket side. So we talk about fractures. Dr. Neer had described this as different parts. So the parts of the shoulder, we talked about this a little bit in the anatomy section. There's the ball, the shaft of the humerus, the greater and the lesser tuberosity, the two areas where the rotator cuff muscles attach to the humerus. So you can have a, a zero part fracture where the fracture pieces have not moved at all or non-displaced to a four part fracture where all the pieces have moved uh, more than one centimeter or changed their angulation 45 degrees. Again, with this particular group of patients, 90% of these are non-surgical. Only about 10% of these particular injuries will require surgery. Most of those we will actually do an open reduction, internal fixation we will actually put a plate and screws into the fracture to hold it in place. These work very well. These plates have only been around for about 15 to 20 years and they really were big game changers in the uh, treatment of these fractures. Sometimes we will pin these, but usually this is what we'll do. The pin, uh, plate and screws is what we'll do. And then sometimes if it's a really bad fracture where it's, where it's irreparable, we'll do a replacement of the shoulder, which usually does not do as well as if uh, for the replacements do for, uh, for shoulder arthritis. And again, what do we do with these patients afterwards? We try to immobilize them for about a month. We try to get early rat, passive range of motion, try to get the shoulders moving. We want to protect where the rotator cuff attaches because those are usually the weak link in the repair. And then usually recovers about 12 to 24 months. These take a long time to get better. And there's unfortunately usually some functional loss. And as I tell all my patients before we do anything with these, whether they're surgical or non-surgical, these are life and limb changing injuries. And the higher part fractures can really be permanently disabling. And usually younger patients will do better than older patients with fractures when they're surgical, non-surgical fractures, we can get better both age groups. All right, so let's talk about clavicle fractures, the collarbone, most common bone broken in the shoulder. So you can see here's a classic clavicle fracture. Here's the one end, here's the other, and here's what's called a butterfly fragment in between. And what we're showing over here is the, muscle, the forces that pull on the shoulder to make these fracture fragments move away from each other. So you have the neck muscles pull up on the clavicle one way, and the weight of the shoulder pulls down, and the pec muscle shortens it, pulling it immediately. And again, 90 plus percent of these we can treat non-surgically with just a sling and immobilization in time. The ones that we want to operate on are basically like this fracture here, which is shortened 100% and displaced 100%, shortened about, about an inch. And we have this butterfly fragment here, which usually does not heal very well. So this is the one that we're usually going to operate on. And you can see here, we've put a clavicle specific plate and screws over the top of the clavicle to hold it in place. And usually people do very well with this. They recover very quickly, usually about two to three months. Okay, let's talk about separated shoulders. These are all still in the traumatic area. So we have grade one to two separation. So separation is different from a dislocation. The separation is involving the 
a chromioclavicular AC joint we talk about. So we grade grade ones and ones and twos are sprains of these ligaments, but the joint the joint itself is overall lined up. And usually with those, we treat these with early motion and then activity is tolerated. And usually that's about a three to six week injury. Grades four, five, and six are the higher grade ones where the clavicle is really up high in the air relative to the acromion. Um, and these are the ones that we have to operate on. And there's multiple different procedures for this. The grade threes, which are kind of displaced, um, are controversial. I kind of usually treat these on a case by case basis because the grade threes are relatively uncommon. And, um, and uh, we usually can watch these initially. And then if we need to operate on them, we'll do that later on. Okay, so what do, I what do I currently do? I've gone through in my career about three different procedures for this. Currently what we do is we take a cadaver graft, uh, a soft tissue graft, and we run it around the collarbone to recreate the ligaments, kind of like this. And then we put a very strong fixation device across the collarbone into the coracoid, which is that bump in the front of your shoulder to recreate this tension on the ligaments and basically pull the collarbone back down to make it line up with the, with the acromion like here. So that's the procedure we do. And usually when there's a lot of procedures, none of them do, really do very well. I would say that this, this cadaver graft procedure seems to do very well, at least in my hands. Okay, let's talk about frozen shoulder, uh, also known as adhesive capsulitis. It's most commonly idiopathic, meaning we don't quite know why it happens, uh, but it's very common in people who are diabetic and also women around menopause or people who have in, uh, endocrinologic problems like hypothyroidism and things like that. It's usually an insidious onset. It's idiopathic, there are three types, idiopathic, post-traumatic, meaning if you had an injury of some sort, or post-surgical, which are usually the most difficult to treat. Uh, it's usually a combination of decreasing motion and increasing pain. Um, and there's three stages, freezing, frozen, and thawing. I know those sound a little basic, but that's really what happens. And this, that whole stage period can take 18 to 24 months to, have to, to pass through. Uh, and the an examination is usually a marked loss of motion. There's a lot of pain and it can start normal, usually normal strength, and it can start out as impingement or pinching syndrome, which I'm gonna show you in a little bit. So again, 95% or more of these patients we can treat without surgery, anti-inflammatory, cortisone injections and physical therapy. Usually I will get by with patients one or two cortisone shots and two to three months of physical therapy, and that usually takes care of it. Now, if there's surgery is, is needed, you know, so I can't get patients better, can't get a patient better with this technique, and if they're not progressing, then what we'll do is some manipulation, which will go basically put the patient under anesthesia and then manipulate the shoulder gently and try to get their motion back. What I usually do is what's called a capsule release where we go and release the scar tissue and the adhesions arthroscopically with our camera and our little heat wands. And then we manipulate the shoulder and then we go treat other pathology as well. So what do we do afterwards? Therapy starts the day after surgery, uh, not because we're, mean, we're cruel or mean doctors. We just, we wanna get people moving right away. We wanna be aggressive and try to get people with their motion very quickly. It's called the pain of gain, meaning it's, it hurts, but you're getting something out of it. And then we do have uh, stretching splints as well, which we can use for people who are really, really difficult cases. We can, it's actually like a big spring and it stretches their shoulder. Okay, let's talk about impingement syndrome. Probably the most common thing I see in my practice, it's a pinching of the rotator cuff by the roof bone or the acromion of the shoulder. Also the rotator cuff does degenerate, what's called tendinosis of, with aging usually hurts them with a maneuver like this with pain with overhead activity. And there is sometimes some weakness. It's usually people have pain at nighttime when they lay on their shoulder or reach overhead to try to grab something off a shelf or they reach around to try to pull their seatbelt on. Those are classic examples of impingement syndrome. It's usually a repetitive overuse problem. It can also be from trauma and then secondary poor mechanics of the shoulder. And there can sometimes be large bone spurs on the roof bone of the shoulder, which cause people, make people more at risk for this problem. So on physical examination, we'll see good range of motion, good strength, provocative maneuvers are these two here. This is the uh, Hawkins sign right here, and this is the Dr. Near sign, just like the same guy with the fractures. So basically we're bringing the shoulder overhead and pinching the rotator cuff under the roof bone. Same thing with this maneuver as well. And then we also wanna watch out for a concomitant frozen shoulder like I had mentioned earlier. So again, I would say probably 99% of the time we treat this without surgery, and 1% of the time we operate on this. So usually we can get by with medicine, anti-inflammatories and physical therapy or home exercise program. Rarely do we do surgery in isolation. This is done oftentimes in conjunction with a rotator cuff repair. So what, this is a little different technique. What we do here is we go into the bursa space, which is the space between the acromion and the rotator cuff down here. And we put water in there and that 
that we fill up and then we can work in that potential space. And we can also, we could basically repair a rotator cuff there. We can take out a bone spur on the roof bone. We can clean out arthritis in the collarbone joint as well. So this is how we would remove a bone spur if it was overhanging and rubbing on the rotator cuff, which would be sitting right down where my arrow is here. And essentially we make this and smooth this out like so. And these patients we can get going very quickly. Usually it's about a two to three month recovery. And there's really no restrictions other than we get moving, moving quickly out of the sling within a couple of days. All right, so let's talk about acromioclavicular joint or AC joint arthritis. These are the same joint that had the separated shoulders. And it's this joint here between the collarbone and the acromion, the roof bone and the acrom and the clavicle. Uh, it can be post-traumatic and be from a fall on a lateral shoulder from an old AC separation. Uh, it can be idiopathic, meaning from repetitive overuse, very common in weightlifters and overhead athletes. And we treat this with cortisone shots and medicine and time. And if that doesn't work, then we go in there and basically shave out about a half an inch of the clavicle and the acromion so, so the bones aren't hitting each other anymore. And this is the classic sign for it. It's called a crossover test where we bring the arm across the body and pinch that AC joint. And it's very similar to, to decompressions where we get people moving right away. Uh, it's usually about a two to three month recovery. Okay, now this is the mother of all shoulder problems, the rotator cuff, the rotator cuff tear. It's very common in people 40 and up. Uh, it can be an acute injury where somebody has a trauma or a dislocation. It can also be chronic from wear and tear. This is the rotator cuff here. This is the tendon and this is the bone. This hole should not be here. And there can be associated injuries that such as with the bicep tendon or frozen shoulder. And what we wanna look for, we wanna look for signs and symptoms. We wanna see shoulder pain in the front of the shoulder typically or the side of the shoulder. Very classic weakness such as we're doing over here with externally rotating the arm, that's a classic weakness maneuver. And this is night pain, not night pain, just laying on the shoulder, but night pain in any position. It'll wake you up from a dead sleep if you're laying in any position. You wanna look at the shoulder. Now this patient right here, I'm showing this one because you see how he has all this atrophy, he has a lot of scalloping of his rotator cuff muscles. So that tells me if he has a rotator cuff tear, it's probably a chronic tear. We wanna check again with strength with external rotation. That's to me the number one sign for checking for rotator cuff tears. So this is an MRI, a coronal MRI of a, of a shoulder. This is the ball humerus and the glenoid. This is the rotator cuff muscle here, the supraspinatus, and here's the tendon, and then we have a big gap here. So you can see the tendon has torn off the bone over here. So that's a classic rotator cuff tear. So sometimes we, we wanna get history and physical, we wanna get x-rays to see if there's a chronic rotator cuff tear. Sometimes there'll be x-ray findings we can tell whether there's a chronic tear. We also want to look for partial tears, which can be part of the aging process. That's what we do on MRI. And then we want to look for a full thickness rotator cuff tear like this guy right here. So again, not everybody needs surgery. Uh, if we have somebody with a chronic rotator cuff tear who's 85 years old, we certainly don't want to try to do surgery on them if we don't have to. Uh, we'd like to try to treat them non-operatively if possible with these things above anti-inflammatories, cortisone injections, and physical therapy. Now, if I have somebody who has an acute rotator cuff tear from a trauma, Usually we're gonna to wanna to fix those. We will try to repair those either arthroscopically or open. Sometimes we will do biological augmentation. I'll show you some of that at the end of the talk. And people usually do better if we fix them within three months of their trauma. So within three, if we can get them within three months of their rotator cuff tear, then that, they tend to be better because after that, there usually tends to be quite a bit of atrophy and the recovery may not be as fulminant. So what we do, we do an arthroscopic rotator cuff repair. I do that probably 95 to 99% no, of the time. We'll do an intraarticular assessment of the shoulder, look at the entire shoulder joint, look at the rotator cuff, look at the biceps tendon, look at the shoulder joint. Then we'll pop up above with our, our scope up into the bursa space above the rotator cuff, and then we start preparing and getting mobilized in the rotator cuff. So what we do is we repair the rotator cuff with little anchors. Here's the rotator cuff. Here are the anchors. And they have little stitches in them. We basically crisscross the stitches across the rotator cuff, and we wrap the rotator cuff back down to the bone and hold that in place. We use a sling for about five weeks. We will do some ice therapy. Uh, I will start therapy very aggressively if we have a frozen shoulder, or sometimes I'll wait up to three weeks if we have a massive rotator cuff tear or if we're doing a re-repair for somebody who didn't heal in the first place. And then we wanna start with a very gentle passive motion pro protocol in the beginning for the first six weeks. Then we'll start doing active and active assistive motion where you're helping or the therapist is helping you move your shoulder for about, a, about one to two months. Then we progress strengthening. It really takes at least three months, probably closer to six to 12 months to recover. And most people show a clinical improvement up to one year after surgery. And I strongly believe that. And recovery does relate to the bigger the tendon tear, the longer the recovery. 
All right, so let's talk about the bicep tendon. There's two tendons in the biceps. There's the short head or direct head, which is the one that goes to the coracoid. And then there's the other one that goes, the long head that goes to the, to the glenoid or the socket of the shoulder. This is the one we're talking about here that causes problems because it, um, it runs over two joints, both the elbow and the shoulder, and makes this very sharp right angle turn around, around the humerus. I call it the appendix of the shoulder because it doesn't do anything good for you. It just causes problems. We do a couple of tests here. We do speeds tests and Jurgensen's tests to basically test for the biceps with a finger over the biceps tendon. And we have the patient resist about uh, forward lifting up the arm. And that'll activate that long hand of the biceps. And what do we treat? Tendonitis or inflammation around the biceps tendon or degeneration of the bicep? We'll try with a injection. It is a bit of a tricky diagnosis because it tends to overlap with the other things in the shoulder. And then if somebody has a rupture, which sometimes happens, they get a Popeye muscle in their arm. You may have seen this before. Usually we'll leave that alone unless somebody has a lot of cramping or pain in the muscle, then we will do something to move the biceps back up. And then with a the dislocation of the biceps, we usually treat the associated rotator cuff tear that occurs with this. And then we'll either do what's called a tenotomy where we just cut the biceps, which is very infrequent, or we'll do a tenodesis where we cut, where we cut the biceps and move it to a different location from the socket of the shoulder onto the ball of the shoulder with a little plastic screw like this. And that's our procedure of choice these days in the United States. So long head of biceps tendon will usually perform with a rotator cuff repair. And usually the rotator cuff repair will take precedence in recovery time. If it's just an isolated biceps tenodesis, we try to get the shoulder moving right away. We have you not doing any supination like doorknob turning of the hand and elbow for about two months and recovery is usually about three to four months. So let's talk about some emerging technologies. We have a lot of things coming on the horizon in the biological area of things we can put in to try to enhance our repairs to try to make them heal better and more efficiently. So we have bone graft substitutes where we can put bone graft, for example, into a fracture that we can try to get that have little pores that make the bone grow through them that makes the bone heal faster and more efficiently. We have biological enhancers where we can do platelet-rich plasma or stem cells or bone marrow aspirate, which are all still somewhat investigational at this point, but we can, we can sometimes put those around our tendon repairs to try and enhance the healing. And then we have biological cements where, again, we can put in a, a paste that's made out of uh, coral or calcium carbonate and that will turn into a paste and then bone can grow through that. And we can also have, we also have scaffolds such as this material up here that we can get collagen to grow through to try and enhance our healing of our tendon repairs. So in conclusion, shoulder injuries are common. These are treated initially conservatively, but oftentimes surgery is important. Uh, and again, as you can see, we do a lot of conservative non-operative treatment if possible. And our outcomes are getting better as technology gets better. Um, we are improving our rehabilitation as well and really our understanding of how to rehabilitate and how to treat tissues better to make them heal better and more efficiently. And we're trying to get um, our improved imaging technology. So we're trying to improve our MRI to make diagnoses better and easier. And then really, I think the biggest thing for the next 15 to 20 years is going to be biological enhancement of the repairs that we do. So we're going to do a repair like this rotator cuff. We're going to put a patch of some material over the top of it and it's going to encourage our tendon to heal. So as opposed to getting in 80 or 85% success rate, we're going to get a 90 or 95% success rate or 100% success rate, which will be great. Okay, thank you very much. That is my talk. Okay, um, do we have any questions? Thank you so much, Dr. Hornstein. Um, yes, if you have any questions, please drop it in the chat box. Um, we yeah, will try to kind of hit all of them. And additionally, I just want to remind everyone that there is um, an evaluation. We would really appreciate your feedback for our program moving forward. So it's a survey monkey link that's also in the chat box. Um, so I will go ahead and read the first question. It is a long one. Um, what is yes, done at the end of shoulder replacement life, 15 to 20 years? At what age would you not do shoulder replacements for healthy older adults? If right shoulder was explained as driving on a bald, bad tire, is there any other step possible in lieu of total replacement? I am limited now, no longer able to do triceps, push-ups, side points, burpees, and much more. I was told these exercises will only hasten the wear down of the shoulder. My current status is about 20 years more of the shoulder life, bringing me to age 88. I miss my active exercise routine. Well, I would have to say that in people in their 60s are probably the ideal candidates for shoulder replacement. Um, they are still healthy and active enough to benefit but not old, so old that their medical conditions may preclude them from having the surgery. Um, so I would say if you're in your 60s right now, 
if the shoulder's going to last you 15 years, I think that's a good thing. At the end of that lifespan, the options are sometimes to do nothing. If your functional level is, is your expectations are being met by the shoulder replacement that you have, or unfortunately you may have to consider having a revision replacement where you take the old one out and you put a new one in. Those don't ever do as well as the first time around, but that would be your option at that point. Um, as far as being active, I think the exercise sometimes are double-edged sword. Sometimes they can really be helpful to strengthen up the shoulder, but also they can cause you pain. So it's a balance of finding the right set of exercises for your shoulder. So you have to really look at uh, each exercise individually. Some people do very well with chest press. Some people do well with push-ups. Some people do well with, uh, with, with planks. It really depends what you're doing. And I think you have to try each individual exercise and say, did that hurt my shoulder? Yes or no. If it doesn't, it's probably okay. If it did, I would probably move on to the next exercise. Thank you. Um, if anyone else has questions, you can also unmute yourself and um, just ask your question or again, drop it in the chat box. We have a few comments about how great your presentation you. was. Thank you very much. <laughs> sure. Uh, okay, so we have a question here. I had a complete tear of the left rotator cuff at 49 years old. I just had my right one done too. Both were wear and tear. Although the right one was not as extensive, it's still a very arduous recovery. My question is, what are the chances of a re-tear on the left side? Well, um, unfortunately, a lot of our repairs, you know, but at 49, you should probably have gotten a full complete repair that healed. That would be my guess. If you're doing well with it, chances are very good that you would have gotten a, a, a well-healed repair. Um, unfortunately, a lot of our repairs don't completely heal, but there's a lot of reserve in the rotator cuff. So if we get a partial healed repair, we can still get a very good outcome. So there've been studies where they look, they look at very large or massive rotator cuff tears and they've done ultrasound or MRI follow-ups, like 50% of them or more will have re-tears in them and didn't heal completely, but the patients are still doing fine. However, with a younger patient with a, with a small to medium tear, I would expect that to be healed. Um, I also will tell you from my own clinical experience that having doing being having done these for 18 years that my experience is when somebody's good past a year i expect them to be good for the rest of their life it's really really uncommon for somebody to come back 10 12 years after a rotator cuff and say my shoulder hurts again they may have arthritis but they pro their rotator cuff should be okay at that point it's ra it's rare if they're if they're good after one year i my experience is they're good Um, I believe we have a link in the chat box if you would like to make an appointment with Dr. Hornstein. RothmanOrtho.com slash contact slash appointment slash make an appointment. Okay, I have a question here. I'll read it. Uh, mm -hmm. Is it safe for a patient who has had bilateral knee replacements and cataract surgery to have with implant lens to have an MRI? The answer to that is yes. Um, as long as there's no metal in your eyes um, from either from previous um, for previous um, surgeries or injuries, you should be able to get, get an MRI, no problem. Are there a few simple exercises that you can do at home? Yes. Um, there are rotator cuff strengthening exercises. Um, I don't have a link to those, but essentially, if, can you guys still see me? Yes? Yes. So basically the exercise would be taking a very light weight. You don't need to go more than about three or five pounds and doing forward raises with your arm side raises with your arm, then laying on your side, putting a little towel underneath your armpit between your arm and your ribs and your arm and doing side rotations. And those are basically the three great exercises and very simple. And those usually work really well for impingement syndrome. Okay. Is a complete shoulder replacement recommended for an octogenarian? Um, I always tell my patients age is only a number and I have octogenarians that are really, really active. And I think if medically you're stable enough to have the surgery and you have a lot of shoulder pain and you need a replacement, I would do it. I'm 75. I have a supraspinatus full tear. I just completed a 16 session physical therapy. I have an acceptable range of motion. I saw my ortho surgeon last week. He said, we'll do an MRI in four months. I sense that my ROM limitation is putting my arm of my injured shoulder behind in my back. Otherwise I go through every day without pain. Hope no surgery will be required. Yeah, I would say that 
I would, ha I would say that you're probably right. You're probably not going to need surgery. Um, most, uh, not everybody I should say, not everybody who has a rotator cuff needs surgery, tear has needs surgery. Um, there are, I just had a patient with that exact same situation and myself, we did a rehab program. They got better. They didn't need surgery. And usually what I'll recommend is have come, have them come back in a year and we can see how they're doing and get a repeat MRI if needed. Cause they, Patients with, it's much easier to do the surgery because once we're done with the surgery and we get it, if we get a good result, which I expect to, then that patient is, is fixed. Uh, it's a little harder to observe a rotator cuff because they will get bigger over time because those muscles keep pulling those, that tendon away from the bone over time. So you have to be careful. You, get, you don't want to get to a situation where you had a repairable situation and then you don't have a repairable situation. But usually six to 12 months is probably enough time to see if a rotator cuff is going to be progressing and how quickly it's progressing. I have arthritis diagnosis in the right shoulder, received a shot about four weeks ago, minimal if any relief. Would another shot be the recommendation or would you suggest something else next? Um, Don, how old, Don, how old are you? Fifty-eight. So um, it really depends how bad your arthritis is. If the shot didn't help, um, I would be looking for a couple other things. I'd be looking for a different diagnosis possibly in addition to arthritis. Um, or on the other hand, sometimes the arthritis is bad enough that it just, the shot didn't work. So if that's the case, then your next options would be to try and consider a physical therapy program. Uh, you could try another shot. Sometimes, you know, we miss the mark with the shot. I'll be honest, we are human. Um, you can always try a second shot. Um, the other option would be to consider something surgical would to either clean up the shoulder arthroscopically or have a shoulder replacement. But um, I would probably try another shot and some physical therapy before I did that. How many shots? How many shots can we have in a year? There's really no limit. I kind of look at cortisone shots as if you know three or four shots hasn't helped, why is five, six, or seven shots going to help? So to me, if, if the first two or three shots have not worked and there's reasonable pathology in that shoulder that could, could benefit from surgery, it's probably not gonna get better without surgery. So it's really not a number of shots, it's more of how many have I tried and if they haven't worked, then why am I gonna keep, you know, the definition of stupidity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Why would I keep doing the same thing, expecting a different result when the first three or four times it didn't, it didn't help? So that, that's my answer to that question. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I'll read the next one. If, um, if you're over 50 and a year out from an injury that caused tears in your shoulder and biceps, can surgeries be successful? Will the recovery be longer? It will probably, if there's a, if there's a biceps tendon injury and a rotator cuff injury, um, like I said, usually people do better if we get to them within three months of their traumatic injury. Now with that said, you could, you can certainly get a good result for somebody who's a year or two years. I've done people who are 10 years out from injuries. Um, or they've had a rotator cuff for five or 10 years and didn't do anything about it and get a good result. The thing is they have to realize it's going to take a little longer to recover and the recovery may not be as fulminant as the person who had the acute, I slipped and fell on the ice, which we had a lot of this winter, tore my rotator cuff, Dr. Hornstein now fixed it. I should get, I should get better. You know, it's still going to take six months to get better, but it should be a more fulminant recovery than somebody who has had this situation where they've had a rotator cuff for 10 years. They've been watching it it's now gotten to the point where it's symptomatic and now those muscles have atrophied for all those years. And just because I plug the rotator cuff back in doesn't mean it's going to necessarily turn those muscles back on hundred percent. So you may not get a complete, as complete a recovery as you would like. Okay, great. Any other question? Yes. Go ahead. I'm scheduled for a complete shoulder replacement. I have severe arthritis. What will my range of motion be afterwards? Will my pain be gone? And can my arthritis come back? I'll start with the last part first. Your pain should not come back because the arthritis is be, will be taken out. This literally, it will be cut out of your shoulder. The ball and socket joint will be cut and reamed out of the, of the shoulder joint. So, and then that'll be replaced with the metal ball and the plastic socket. Um, function will be better I can't say it's going to be perfect, but it'll probably be a little better than what you have now. Um, but usually patient, patients' range of motion is some, pretty close to what they go into it. It may get a little better with the replacement, but pain will be much better. 
I'll read the next one here. Uh, I have arthritis and limited extra rotation with considerable pain at night and exercise is painful. I am 64 and just had an injection four months ago that was very helpful. How long should I put off having a replacement? I would say if the shot is still working, I would go, I always tell patients, use the, the non-operative treatment as long as you possibly can. Because once you've done the surgery, you've done the surgery and there's no going back from that. So I would, I would suggest if you have a shot that's still working, ride that shot out. And when the shot wears off, go back and get another injection. And when those shots stop working, that might be the time to start thinking about surgery. I saw a hand up from Gary. Gary, did you have a question? Okay. Um, if anyone else has a question, go ahead, drop it in chat. Um, if not, we can pretty much wrap up this lecture for tonight. <clears throat> You're welcome. Ah, most treatment for frozen shoulder. Okay, what is the most common treatment for frozen shoulder? That's a good question. Um, in my, pr I, would, I would tell you 95% of the time or more, we get this better without surgery. So usually I will see patient in the office, it'll be a, usually a woman around 50 who has right around menopause or diabetic patients. They will um, come in and we'll get some x-rays, make sure everything looks okay. They'll have a gross loss of motion in all planes, especially going behind their back. So we will, I usually recommend at that point, we try a cortisone shot in the shoulder joint and of course a physical therapy for about six weeks. And that oftentimes resolves it probably at least 50% or more of the time. And sometimes they'll come back for a second shot and a little bit more therapy. And that usually resolves it about 90% of the time. So the most common treatment for frozen shoulder is gonna be non-surgical. Now, when somebody gets, does get to surgery, I will usually treat them with an arthroscopy and we'll clean up all the adhesions and release the adhesions and manipulate their shoulder. And then we start them on therapy right, right away the day after surgery. So that's my non-surgical and my surgical treatment for frozen shoulder. Okay, I saw a hand up from Yvette. Did you have a question? One from Don. I am in Princeton. Which shoulder doc would you recommend? Uh, you can come see me. I'm just in Pennington, just around the corner. Hi, Yvette. Yes, go ahead. Um, yes, so I care for my dad and I use a sit and stand a couple times a day. And I've been experiencing shoulder pain Oh, off and on. It started about three years ago and it stopped once my dad moved in, but now it's back. And so when I, when I sleep at night, it wakes me up. So I'm using it quite often. It's my left shoulder. Um, and I'm just wondering, since I care for my dad and that's like an activity that I can't stop, what can I do? Well, I mean, if it's really bothering you that much at night, uh, and you're having trouble caring for your dad, I would probably come see somebody um, and consider getting an evaluation. We get x-rays, we can examine you, all that stuff, and then determine what the best treatment is. And as I said before, even though we are orthopedic surgeons, the large majority of what we do is not surgery. So we take care of a lot. We take care of a lot of things without surgery and chances are good that we can probably get away without surgery for you. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, can I ask a question? Yes, go ahead. Um, okay, I'm 47 and I had this shoulder pain like three months ago. It started and then I've been going to chiropractor and then I was told I'm not supposed to move much. And then um, I'm still going like a, twice a week and then um, they do ultrasound treatment and then um, just keep telling me to put ice but um, last three months it's not getting so much better so do you think it's not a right treatment well i mean i I, I think you have to make a diagnosis first and see what the problem is you know one thing i didn't talk about is that sometimes the neck can be a source of shoulder pain um and that may be what they're treating but i'm 
again, I, I, it's hard to determine what, based on treatment, what the diagnosis is, but um, you probably need to get evaluated in to, by a shoulder specialist to see what's going on with your shoulder. Because if it hasn't gotten better in three months, it's probably not going to get better by just continuing to do the same thing over and over. So I took an x-ray and then there's no, um, nothing's wrong with the bone, but uh, right. you said that there's um, like a, I don't know, lack of well, tendon. And yeah, there could be a whole bunch of different things wrong in the shoulder. So just because mm -hmm. an x-ray is normal does not mean that your shoulder is normal because it's hurting. If it, it shouldn't hurt. If it was normal, it wouldn't hurt. Okay. And if it's approaching shorter, do you think it's just gonna, you know, normally it go, goes away after one and a half year or something or, or issue? Is, yes. Next? So yeah, that's, that's the thing. You ha sometimes it takes a year to year and a half to go away without treatment. Some people want to do that. Other people don't want to do that. And most people will try the non-surgical treatment for the frozen shoulder, uh, as we talked about. And like I said, the majority of people will get better without surgery with a frozen shoulder. Um, it's, I probably do half a dozen patients a year for frozen shoulder surgery. It's, it's relatively uncommon um, because the large majority of them get better without surgery. So, and what we try to do with, with our treatments is try to shorten that year and a half to two year recovery to, you know, a couple months if we can do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, there's another question. What are the complications that you see occurring with replacement? How often do complications occur? Um, biggest complication risk is, is infection. That's the biggest concern for all of our guys that we, that do replacements. Um, it, uh, is low risk. It's probably, it's less than 1%. That's always the biggest concern. Um, the other problem with frozen, with, with frozen shoulder, with shoulder replacement is that, um, over time and why they fail is because the socket of the shoulder loosens because the cement doesn't hold it. It gets very high stress in that area. So that's, that's, that's the long-term complications. Short-term complications with, froze, with, uh, with um, shoulder replacement is going to be an infection, um, which is with any, any joint replacement, not just shoulder specifically. Uh, and then long-term is going to be with potential loosening of the socket of the shoulder joint replacement. Okay, great. If there are no other questions, um, I'll go ahead and wrap up this lecture. Thank you everyone for coming and thank you, Dr. Hornstein, for your time tonight. It's been my pleasure. Okay, thank you, Megan, for okay, your help. Take care. Okay. Have a good night, everybody. Have a good night.